I'm very, very happy to have. If I say living legend till I ever make a bad joke or be too humble to deny it or be too humble to accept it. But I have a pleasure of talking to a living legend, ladies and gentlemen. Kevin Rutmain is yes, from The Cows, Tomahawk, uh, and so many other bands. But we're not going to talk about those in detail. <laughs> so, Melvins. Kevin, thanks a lot. Melvins. Yeah, you were also in the Melvins, but we already got two Melvins interviews lately. So come on, let's forget about oh, that. Oh, yeah, fuck those guys. Yeah. Yeah, right. Who's King Buzzo anyway? No idea. Yeah, true. So, uh, Kevin, first question that we always ask our interview partners. What is the band merch or shirt or underwear that you're wearing today? I am wearing Vondor. Ooh. You familiar well, with I'm Vondor? Also where... I, I've heard the name. Uh, it's, uh, that looks very black metal, look. but I guess the way they look at it, you know, that they are not black metal, right? Well, look at his look at his corpse paint. It's yellow. That's why. I think that's I think that's kind of genius. Yeah, it is. My, right, it definitely. My is. wife but, had this. My wife made this shirt for me for Christmas or my birthday or something. Well, I'm I'm actually wearing also some kind of black metal thing, but it's a Unruh from Germany. Um, I don't know. That is like definitely black metal. Unruh, yes, Unruh. Wander is um, very old from the nineties. Oh no, that is that is like two thousand tens, and they're still playing, still really good. So, Kevin, where are we catching you right now? I am in my living room in Los Angeles, California, USA, North America, <laughs> continent, whatever. Right. Um, so, after I looked at some of the promo photos that we got for. Um, the two new records that we're going to talk about in detail. I first have to ask, because you were shown in a hat, and I got to ask, who had the better mm. hat, J.R. Ewing from Dallas or Hoss from Bonanza? Those are such old TV shows. Yeah, I, I think know. that anyone, I think anyone would agree with me that Hoss Cartwright, Cartwright had the best hat. Yeah. Dan Blocker, and, come on. Yeah, that was... Definitely an iconic character that he played there, right? Um, so you are not publishing one. You are publishing two records. But on the same day, who came up with that idea? That would be Joachim at, at uh, Rock as Hell Records. They were both done. They've both been done for quite a while. So he just asked to come up with it. Oh, I'm, pardon? So the Austrian, Austrians. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably the most efficient way or something. Who knows? Well, we are He's going to talk a... about both. And I also think that they are really worthwhile talking about because they're very different from each other. They are, yes. So shall we start with your, I think, second cooperation with Trevor Dunn? Is that correct? Second one? Yeah, the other one was uh, a 10-inch... Uh, lathe cut, and we and a couple of those songs are on the new one. I think two of the songs taken from that are on the new. One. We made very few of those. Didn't you get um? Didn't you get a novella novello award for something? Some for some some thing that you did with Trevor, like two years ago or something like that. You know what? That biography was written. It's completely by made David up Lick. because I looked it up. Yes, there, I don't think there's one true thing in there. David mm. Livingstone from the God Bullies wrote it for me. What I liked about it is when uh, he compared um, some of the tracks on the new album. Like, I think he, he ever spoke like a, a steamroller or a locomotive running through everything. And I was like, mm, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Strange. Do you, know the Do you know the American word hyperbole? Yeah, but that one is more than a hyperbole. That's an hyperbole to the max. <laughs> yeah, it's an extreme hyperbole. It is. So for everybody, if you read it up, just like Super Dope Me did at the first time, Novello Award was like, mm -mm, the guys didn't win it. Yeah. And nevertheless, I have to say, I like both records, but I like the new one a little bit better. 
and I can't even tell you why. What I like about it is which one's I, the new one? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, which new one? I don't know what you mean. Which one? Well, the one that what is it? Crack. Let me look it up. Oh, oh, the new. I Crack see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I like that one better. Also, by by the way, what a title! Crackpot yeah. Forehead. That's Trevor's. Uh, Trevor's turn. <laughs> So um, what I like about the new record that you did with Trevor is that it is cohesive in attitude and it's very open-minded, but it's also very incohesive when it comes to sound. Was that an option for you or was, an, an intentional yeah, thing? I, it was intentional in that we both absolutely refused to uh, say no to anything. Okay. You know what I mean? Nothing was off limits. Then let me ask it this way. So you come along and say like, oh, let's do something soulish on one of the tunes. And Trevor is like, yes. No. No, that's way too much, way too much definition. One of okay. us would, one of us would, would just record something mm -hmm. and then send it to the other one through email mm -hmm. and say, here. And that and then the other one would elaborate on that? Yeah, just record some stuff on top of it, mm -hmm. send it back maybe, mm -hmm. and then the mm -hmm. other one would go, sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. I can it. see I, I, I think can I see mentioned how in the, I, I mentioned, I think, in one of the write-ups that the only time I remember either of us laying down a rule was Trevor said, I left some, a long space empty. And he said, I was hoping you'd add something there. That's it. That's the only guideline I remember. But nevertheless, I mean, like being somewhat of a music journalist, I have to try to put it into words. And sure, there are many different, different, for lack of a better word, let's call them styles, because I hate the term genres. Yeah. And no, I get it. it there is something in there which sounds like soulish, whatever that could mean in mm -hmm. the context of Kevin Rodmanis and Trevor Dunn. Mm -hmm. um, some other things sound like very early industrial, like Neubauten or Gristle or something mm -hmm. like that, when they still sure. honored the term <laughs> industrial. Mm -hmm. How difficult was it? to still turn all of those things into incohesive songs. Incohesive? Yeah, I think there is some incohesiveness in there, and I love it. I, I think, like, it's it's a free-for-all. Well, I think uh, because Trevor and I have both played and composed stuff for so long that I think because of that, there is at least to our ears some inherent co cohesiveness, which sometimes, uh oh, am I frozen? Which sometimes sounds like chaos. I'd say cha chaotic, but not incohesive. There, how's that? That is a very good, that is a very good thing. So, yes, I, I agree with that. There is a lot of chaos going on. Um, and and nevertheless, it sounds very in interesting in the best sense of a word, because yeah. what I love about the record is that it is not a record that you will understand after ten listens. You will need Thank a you. lot of spins. I, the one thing I do remember thinking in my head, and then mentioning a little bit to Trevor, is I didn't want it to be off-putting or. Um, I wanted it to be friendly and fun, you know, rather than uh, uh, shrill and and uh, alienating. Which I love. I love music that's abstract, shrill, and alienating. I just didn't want to do that with this record. I think that's maybe one of the overarching. Because I remember he and I were talking about bass lines, and I said something about a sad bass line, and he said, "Oh God, I can do those all day." You know, can we? You know, can we do something else? And I said, "Yes, actually." Write the happiest bass line you can think of. It's funny that you say that, because that was one of the things that struck me about the record 
And I think that also goes into what you were saying. It is not aggressive in a way that it's trying to push people away. And a lot right. of it has, for me, has to do with Trevor's baselines. Um, because, correct me if it's just my bad hearing, but there is some kind of warmth underneath oh, yeah. a lot of it. Absolutely. So, you know, <clears throat> keep in mind that, that, keep in mind that there's two bass players. It's, it's not always obvious to me anyway, who did what, you know? So I, I but, think I'm not trying to minimize Trevor at all. I'm just saying that there was a, a really a lot of mix going on in a, in a very positive way. Yeah. And um, do you know this guitarist, um, Davey Williams? He's passed away. Do you know this guy? I have pretty to admit abstract I don't. guitar player. Okay, I have to admit pretty that. abstract guitar player. Do pretty abstract guitar player. Really, really free. Did a ton of stuff, but I, I was inspired by him in that it's always cheerful. It mm -hmm. cheerful. He did tons of records, and I really appreciated that because it's pretty free abstract stuff. But it, it's it never. Uh, it's just cheerful. It's very cheerful, pleasant music, which I really was impressed by. Which I also think is very important. If you make a kind of, to to take again your term, chaotic record, you know, if you if it is if it's chaotic and warm, you will keep on listening to it. But if it's chaotic and I think so <clears throat> aggressive aggressive, you will put it away after two or three listens, right? I mean, well, to be fair, I have tons of records like that that I just love that are cold and off-putting, and I love them, and I do keep playing them. I just didn't want to do that only because it was an interesting challenge, sort of. Mm -hmm. And I think we did it. You, you definitely nailed that. You definitely nailed that. Um, also, because some of the lines that we hear in some of the songs, I mean, like, on the track Rickety Rick, we can hear... The repeated line, heaven, I'm in heaven, which apart from being like an indirect quote of cheek to cheek, um, was it for you heaven to construct those songs with Trevor? You know, um, I'm in heaven was the second half of a couplet. The first was surrounded by corpses, surrounded with corpses, surrounded by corpses, surrounded with corpses. I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven. So you see, you've isolated it and, and stripped it of its true meaning. Um, but but yeah, but what was the question? Yes, it was a heavenly experience recording with Trevor. Absolutely. And then something that I wanted to get at, because you took you now dismantled my construction. Um, I wanted to, to ask, <laughs> because, because it is countered by this corpses thing, um, is that also your sense of humor nowadays and also has ever been? I don't know if that's, I didn't, I don't know if I would strictly, I mean, it wasn't meant to be bad, but I, I wasn't thinking about humor, but I guess it is funny. That's so inherent in the way I think and speak that I couldn't even tell you, but I will tell you this little point. It's surrounded by corpses and then surrounded with corpses. And I was reading about those two words, by and with, and mm. surrounded Surrounded with is a good thing, like a family, surrounded with family. And yeah. by is an aggressive thing. I'm surrounded by monsters. But, so, by enemies. So, yeah. ho, 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 how about that? <laughs> it's it's funny, you know, talking um, talking about those little details. And again, um, that is something that I love about records like that. Being able to dig deep to ping them through over and over again. I want to get back to one f thing that you've already mentioned. You've mentioned that basically you and Trevor were sending stuff back and forth. Um, yeah. But but there is a third person on the record, right? Lee, and I know oh, I will mispronounce Lee. the word, Lee Afentopoulos. Oh, I it's a Greek name. That's right. Yeah, it is. I know. But but where did you find him? You know, how did he get into the picture? Well, to be honest. Yes. This is top secret. He's my wife's brother. 
<laughs> so he's your brother-in-law. Yeah, great drummer, great drummer. And uh, he lives in Perth, Australia. Wow, my wife so that's from... like... Right. Again, sent right. all over the globe. Cool. Um, it's great. He's really good. So it was fun to include him. There's only a real drummer on those two songs. The rest of it is bullshit online. You know, there's weird drum machines and stuff. Of course. But but I, I loved the fact that there is a third person involved in a record done by two people who are already known for our, for their unlimited creativeness. Um Something else, I've already mentioned the track name Riggedy Rick. We also have a few other ones. But to what extent do song titles for you have a real importance? They don't always tie. So often, I mean, Trevor named some of them. I don't think there's a direct relation to the music necessarily, but they're phrases that we like. Mm -hmm. Let me just show you something. Please. This is Rick. I could show you mine, but she's already sleeping. But Rickety Rick, that's him. <laughs> that's that's good. I love that. Yeah. Do you um, know what Rickety means? I do. Like, isn't it something like rugged? No, it means like uh, not very stable. <laughs> okay. Well, like a I, I could build. say that about our eight month old as well. Oh, you have a baby. Yeah, but now she's getting into puberty and it's uh, difficult. <laughs> yeah, they're wild. I love them. Yeah. So yeah. that was named after him for no particular reason. I just liked mm -hmm. the phrase rickety rick. Yeah. But there are also sometimes, as you said, there are some tracks where one can have a feeling of sensing some kind of underlying sure. connection. For example, something that I liked and also had to look, look it up, you named one track Irving Fine goes to Louisville. So that I was Trevor. I was just, I was going to bring it up. Trevor named that. And I think he was going for a feeling of Americana, you know? Bingo. That is something that struck me because on that track, I had like a feeling as if there was some underlying minor tunes that could have been a piano or a bass or something in between. I don't know. But it struck me as if there was some kind of warm neoclassical slash classic Amer American early 20th century composing underneath that. Exactly so, right. So it's it's You're the way that it's astute. not always not always fun, right? Which is also again another point where you know another fun thing about the record, you know, being able to dig deep. Um, what I thought of when I listened to it again, and here I come back to the, to the track title, um, not the track title, the record title, who came up with that idea? Crackpot Whorehead. I mean, like, it sounds horrible. That's Stur uh, not Stur it's, um, Trevor. Trevor came up with that. You know, I'm sure you noticed it's just split to common American phrases and switched them. There's there's a crack yeah. whore and, and, and pothead. And pot, yeah, I know. But even in, in even when I take them apart and put them back together the way they usually are, and it still sounds horrible. And um, I, don't I don't know. Find it's it just, horrible. You don't find it horrible? Okay, cool. <laughs> Not at all. Okay. I think it gave us a little smile and that was it. There wasn't it's, – it's not a heavy time. It's not meant to be. Is is that also something that you say, like, um, because you say that's not nothing that offended you or nothing that made you feel uneasy or something else, whatever you want no. to call it. Uh, is that also something that is nowadays very important for you to make stuff that you like, the way you like it, who with whom you like it, when you like it? Well, that's always been the case, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't always do it in other people's... You know, I mean, I, you know, if, if like, like with Buzz or Patton and Dennison, those were their, those were their babies. They had mm -hmm. to fall within whatever constraints were laid in. But still, like Buzz, 
Buzz is an expert at using people's strengths. So I was able to still follow what you're saying, you know, within those parameters. But yeah, I would say that's always been the motive. And Trevor, too. I mean, that's what people, if they like what you're doing, that's what they like, you know. That is something that strikes me because um, a few weeks ago we had an interview with with Dale and he's, he mentioned basically the same thing. He said that Buzz knows how to play to people's strengths and use people's yep. strengths. Uh, let me just ask that one last question um, on because on uh, about the Melvins. Do you think that that is one of the, the strengths of the Melvins, that they have a band leader who is so good at using people in the right kind of way? Absolutely. Absolutely. He um, he has a strength where he, he uh, his ego doesn't dictate things. He, he wants people to have an input because I think I do this with Trevor or with, I mean, I, I probably learned it from him is, is um, people, if you like what they do, they're going to bring something that you I wouldn't have thought of to do the stuff that Trevor did. That's why I said, Trevor, do whatever you do. Even with Jim, who did our recording, or mixing rather, he really liked it because he said, I've never had anyone say, just do what you think. Because he's going to know stuff I don't know, you know. And I, I've already, I've made so many records, I already had my chance to perch on the shoulder of a guy and dictate every little sound and mix. And it, it's not a very good way to work, I don't think. Because once I started giving those guys leeway to do what they're experts at, things got a lot more interesting. Jim was a big part of both those record sounds. He added stuff that we didn't ask him to add. Mm -hmm. So you would also say, or I Ooh. guess you would agree, that giving people free reign makes them try to bring out their very, very best. Sometimes, sometimes I've had to tell people, not always, but you know, people, it's, yeah, I've said to people, I've said to drummers, I know, hey, do that thing that no one will let you do, you know, because people try to limit other players and they might, you know, they might see it as overplaying or something, but I want to hear that stuff that they they can do, that they don't, you know, I want to hear a drummer go ape shit, you know, go, let's hear it, you know. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I, that is definitely something for everybody who is into digging deep, digging long. Listen to Crackpot Whoreherd by Don and Rodmanis out February 17th. On Done, the same with day, Done with yeah. Rodmanis. Done with Rodmanis. You with. get the joke there? Yeah, because you're not with. surrounded by. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it's even funnier. Done with Rodmanis is that Tomahawk is that Dunn replaced me. So then Tomahawk is done with Ritmanis. See? <laughs> multi multi levels of humor there. Yeah. That's what I love about you guys. Oh, oh the whole bunch of you. Um, and on the same day, on February 17th, there will also be another record released by Kevin's, let's call it another project, Hepatitis. Another, another f fantastic band name, by the way. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, and the record is called An Eat. And it starts yes. with a kind of programmatic line where you say, I think I'm going to uneat these seven sandwiches now. Which is more or less a, a different way of saying, I have to puke. That's true. But what he, it's David, again, that wrote the bio. And what he says is, I think that I shall uneat these salmon sandwiches, the fish. Yeah, but you say seven sandwiches. Salmon. Oh, then I missed. Then I just simply misheard that. I didn't even get it from the bio. I think I heard seven. Sorry. Nevertheless, yeah, yeah. it sounds as if basically you're trying to say like, "Oh, I ate too much. I have to puke." Um, yes. Uh, and of course, puking being a very spontaneous, <laughs> very spontaneous <laughs> thing, um, it doesn't sound as if the songs are the result of a quick one and done jam no, session. it's not a direct it's not a direct comment on the music i just thought it was yeah. a cool funny term it is and i mean like would you agree that uh on eat is a little little bit more accessible than crackpot whorehead 
Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, like, I don't know when both records were written or constructed, but was Even it also something that was important to you to publish one record, which is a little bit more abstract, where you have to dig a lot of stuff into and where you have to crawl your nails into it, and then also release a record which is very funny, which is very noisy. Sure. Um, so that was your intention? No, that's just what happens when you use those people. <laughs> you know what I mean? I yeah. said, I said, Paul Sterling, those are the two other guys in uh, hepatitis. Let us, I mean, you know, this was all during the virus. No one could, we couldn't even hang around with each other. Mm -hmm. And I needed something to do. I was also making music with my wife, Lords and Lady Kevin. It was just, there was nothing else to do, but it was a real gift. Because I remember saying several times, This is the most consistently I've been able to work on music since when I first started. It was like all day, every day. It was so great. So I think we did them about the same time, and it was just composing and listening. I the word composing, writing and, and listening, and that was it. You know, sometimes they sent me stuff, mm -hmm. recorded drums and, and, and guitar, And then some, you know, I did, what I really liked about it was working this way was arranging songs was so, you could be, I could hear it so much better. It was a real fun way to work. I think the songs are better constructed as a result than they, than they are in the past, maybe. And um, so I, I sent them stuff, here's a riff, and they would build around it, or they would send me stuff and I would add stuff and build around it, maybe send it back, maybe not, mm -hmm. and then send it off to Jim, mix. And can you, or do you have any idea how long it took you to get that stuff to where they are now? The whole record, not mm. single songs, but how long did it take for the whole record right. to come? It was, there was no schedule, so I don't really know. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't every day that we were sending it back and forth. I mean, I think we blew off songs for a long time sometimes, you know, not for any reason, just there was no, there was no schedule. It was, that was also nice. It's not as if there is a deadline, right? Um, right. And then I could work on, I did all the different things all the time. I was all different groups, just screwing around playing or, or editing. It was a lot of fun. I can imagine. Um, because I also, when listening to Uneat, it, it definitely sounds like a hell of a fun that you had when you did that. Um, yeah. It's also meant to be pleasant and not, Not a bad trip. <laughs> no, that, that is something that I definitely, I, that is something that I never heard in any of your records, whether it's with cows oh, or with anything else. It's never, it never feels as if you try to make people feel uneasy. That is definitely a gift that you have. Um, well, however, when I thought about it, um, uneat is... It is more accessible than Crackpot Jorge, for sure, but it isn't in any way pop, right? It isn't in any way popular music. Ah. Uh, it isn't even something that many people would call rock, right? Although I, I think, I, although I think, and that is one of the few things where I think the write-up might intentionally be a little bit on the right side. Uh, because it says, like, this is what rock and roll could be in the 21st century. Mm. Um, because when we remember, what was rock and roll back in the 50s? It was making parents shit their pants because something somebody was shaking his pelvis. Um, it was blues-based. It was also blues-based, which was not... White people, white people didn't take any credit for or were... I don't know if they, I don't know, in the mainstream view, you know, I'm sure you know, people were shocked and some people were horrified to discover that Elvis was white. Yeah. So that part of the, I can imagine. Part of the trip. Um, yeah. But once again, you take away something that I wanted to ask later. So co let's come back to the blues thing. Directly. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this, is this album your version of the blues? Oh, I wouldn't think of it as the blues. I would, see, I would... I love rock and roll, mm -hmm. and that is obvious. That oh, good. I I, I, I think it is obvious. 
that's the closest I can come to doing rock and roll. Then, then that is what I thought about the record. Because I thought, I mean, like, as itchy and scratchy as it is in parts, it is accessible. It's fun. It, 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 makes, you, so. it makes you smile in a very positive Good. way. That's excellent. Good. Um, so is there, is there any sort of direct inspiration for Uneat? No, direct, no. I, except for the one song's a cover. Um, Doe Deer is a cover of uh, uh, Crystal Castle's song. So that, I guess that's like having a, a touchstone. And I was so impressed. I had never heard that band. Do you know them? I, I looked it up when I did the research for this interview. And I was also surprised what I heard. And I, then I was also, again, surprised at what you did with it. Did you, you so you heard their version? Well, I, I gathered something from the internet which seems to be very original yeah. or very version, let's yeah. put it like that. Well, I think she, Alice Glass, I think she's a remarkable singer. And I knew I wouldn't be able to outdo her, beat her at her game. So I, uh, I may try to make it, I still wanted it to be good and I wanted it to be that song. But yeah, you're right, it's intentionally different because I knew I was never going to beat her at her own game. No way. So I made it my own. Our I own, mean, like, I should say. Then let me ask a general question about cover versions. Which one do you like more? The ones which try to stick to the original or the ones where the new artist, the cover artist, tries to make it his own and in a very different way? I've seen both work. I've seen mm -hmm. both be great. Have you ever heard that Bauhaus cover of uh, Telegram Sam? Yeah. That is a That's very, really that is good a very... cover. <laughs> That's a badass cover, and uh, 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 Buzz is really good at making covers that stand up to the original. It's a real strength of his, too. But I, I don't have that. Inevitably, you know, if someone else is going to do a close, a similar cover, it's still going to sound like them. So I don't know. I don't, I don't have that rule, necessarily. It's just some, sometimes it works great, and sometimes it mm -hmm. doesn't. Mm -hmm. To my ears. And, you know, everyone hears things differently. Mm -hmm. What also strikes me about hepatitis in general is when looking at your long career, it seems <laughs> as if as if it is important to you not to become redundant because every project has a different yeah. kind of feel to it. Is that important to you? Mm. It is, but it's not necessarily conscious. Oh, okay. I don't, but yeah, I mean, uh, you hope that, you know, as an artist, that you're going to keep evolving. But it's a, it's a crapshoot because it alienates people too. Because they, if they like something, they want to hear that again, which I get. But it's not, it's not, it's, I don't think I could pull it off, to be honest. I don't mm -hmm. think I could write a cow's song now just keep evolving and changing and it wouldn't sound the same well maybe you could do an homage to the cows yes but yeah i could <laughs> but would it be a real what the thing that is striking about the cows of course is you are totally right you could not do another cow song because yeah. when you wrote those songs you were like 30 35 40 years younger than now and of course right. the urgency of that age yeah Although, of course, you are young and very fresh looking and uh, oh, up to the tip. Yeah, I look like, like a teenager. Yeah. yeah, we both do. Yeah. Um, even though we don't give a shit about teenage music right now, right? Um, I don't know it. But of course, the urgency would be lacking. And that is something that, that I like about it. You know, it doesn't seem to be as if you try to do something again and again and again. There is no formula to what Rod Maynes is doing. And sometimes um, that leads to, sometimes that leads to missteps, too. I've made mistakes because I keep evolving. And then suddenly I'll go, oh, you know, I don't really need to do this. But it's okay. It's all part of the thing. Could you, could you give an example for when you think in retrospect or in hindsight that you yeah. made a mistake? 
Oh, sure. Um, in general, I can't think of a specific song, but I feel like there was a point where things were getting too complicated mm -hmm. because I got, I think subconsciously, I was like, oh, this is too re redundant. I was worried about redundant, as you say, but I think I confused the issues and lost sight of some. I think some of the songs are a little because I was worried about being bored. I get bored writing because, oh, I've already done this. I avoid mm -hmm. sometimes cliches that don't need to be avoided. Mm -hmm. Oh, where you say like, okay, you see it as if it could be one, and in reality it ain't. It really, it's just giving someone something pleasurable to listen to. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, you got to give everyone a break. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I have a question about again one of the track titles on on Eat, uh, El Rey Viz. Is it I, an homage to the King of Rock and Roll, or is there some supposed King of Latin Rock and Roll that we should all listen to? No, you know what it is. It's an homage to someone who is paying homage to Elvis. There was an old book a long time ago, and it was Elvis impersonators. Ah. Uh. And one of their names was L. Ravis, which I thought was a great name. I think the guy's name was Ray. I think the guy's name was Ray, so he called himself L. Ravis. And when I, I just love that name. And that song uh, is about, in my head, it's about a homeless Elvis impersonator. So he's doing all these Elvis moves, but he lives on Skid Row. So nobody really cares. What I also like about the... the title and then of course also about that elvis impersonator is the guts to give himself the name l king this isn't it wonderful yeah it is um i have like a few more questions before we come to our infamous quickfire round where you get two alternatives uh one question that always strikes me, what is your go-to instrument for when you're writing songs? Is there one or are you variable? I vary. It's, it really is between bass and guitar. Mm -hmm. I used to do, in the early days of the cows, sometimes I wrote things on the piano, just riffs, mm -hmm. just because it's laid out differently. So it makes you use notes you don't use normally. Mm -hmm. That's about it. But you don't sit down and write down your stuff you just basically oh i don't know play how to, it no i don't know how to score stuff and in fact i have to record because i will forget almost immediately the the rhythm i'll remember the notes but not the rhythm and the mm -hmm. first blush rhythm is always better so i just record mm -hmm. while i'm doing it or i'll blow it yeah again because that first rhythm has a kind of urgency right it's something that is i don't know i just always like it maybe i just won't i don't know i always like it better i don't know why Maybe it's urgency. Sure. You're absolutely right. <laughs> no, not always. Um, I have to ask one question about the cows because everybody loves the cows. I love the cows. So I have to ask one question and I don't want to ask the obvious stuff. Um, in your opinion, which cows record is the best one to start with and why? To start with? Yeah. I guess the, I for guess all the our listeners one. out there who always heard the term, oh, you got to listen to the cows, you got to listen to that. Oh. And they're always like, yeah, yeah, which one to start with? I guess I'd pick either the first one or the last one, depending. The first one, because that's the, <laughs> that's the bottom line. That's the cows right there, laid out very clearly. And then the last one, because it was, uh, we really advanced in a way that I liked. And it was our final evolution. Buzz produced that record. Is either one of those two also the one that you're proudest of? I'm equally proud, I would say, of all of them. That is, that is one a good thing to say. Yeah, one does not prefer one child over the other. Well, depends on whether one child is Hitler and the other is Mussolini, then you're right. But if one child is Hitler and the other is, you know what I want. No, 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 no. You're a parent. You love them all equally, even the fascists. <sighs> I'm very happy that I'm very happy that mine doesn't turn out to be one of them. Yeah, you just you stepped in that, didn't you? Um, you know, being a politics teacher, I think my morals are. Questionable. Sometimes in my way. Let's put it like that. You should do what I do. 
I'm a vacuum of morals. Doesn't work with my profession and my my senses, but I'll tr I'll give it a try. Um, okay. So we, you go ahead first. About what? No, uh, about parenting. Oh no, I got nothing. Okay. So let's come to the last part of every interview for Radio Sound, and the interviews always end with our infamous quick fire rounds. You okay. will get two alternatives like roses versus tulips. And you have to choose one of them and give a short explanation. Okay. Let's, let's start with something, well, something modern. Uh, I mean, like we were both people who don't listen to the charts that much, but I'll give you Billie Eilish versus The Weeknd. I've never heard The Weeknd. But I, I gave Billy an honest try, and I got to tell you, I hate her music. So then you no would choose to her as a person. Because... Yeah, it's yeah, nothing against of... her as a person. Yeah, just out of uh, ignorance, I would have to go with The weekend, but I don't even know who that is. Well, some of my friends would say the, the best Super Bowl halftime show ever, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> the worst ever. Yeah, that sounds like the same thing. <laughs> it does. Um, I know that you're from from up north, so I'll give you the replacements versus Husker Du. Oh, Husker Du. Okay. Just no because question. the replacements. Oh, you want a little more? Bit. You want me to elaborate? Yeah, sometimes. Because I never play the replacements, and I still listen to the Husker Du. Um, mm -hmm. And they just pound for pound, there are way more Husker Du records that I like than there are replacements records. I and, I and there's that. a lot of replacements I don't like at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if you listen to either of them, but Neubauten versus Frobbing Gristle. Oh, I listen to both. So, which one do you choose? I'd have to go with the Gristle. No offense, Blixa. First of all, Blixa has an X in his name. What the fuck is that? Oh. That's already a screw up right there. Oh yeah, Thriving Gross. Again, it's I listen to I still listen to them all the time. And I mean I like Neubotten a lot. But I push come to shove, I'd have to I'd have to go with Gristle. It's interesting. I, I know a lot of people would choose Throbbing Gristle, and I still have to go back to Neubauten. I don't know what it is, but there is something about their biography and their way of er, their early way of writing or composing stuff that just resonates yeah. with me a lot. But maybe it's yeah, also yeah, just it's because a, I'm German. Maybe they approach music really differently from each other. You know, Throbbing Gristle didn't know how to play any instrument. No. And yeah. they also didn't, I, as far as I remember, they didn't build the instruments the way that Neubauten did, right? I, I don't think that's true. I think Chris Carter developed and designed a lot of that electronics. Okay. Yeah. Maybe he I'll was, have to dig into that biography again. Yeah, that's. That, I think he's like a really advanced that whole technology. Mm -hmm. As you were part of a Melvin's. Stoner yes. Witch or Houdini? I don't really listen to either of those. Uh, well, I can't remember which one's one. which. I can't remember which one's a, a which. Houdini, Stoner Witch. Houdini is the one that Kurt produced. <laughs> yes, produce. Yeah. Produce. Produce. See, like I'm making quotes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, from what I can gather, I don't think he had much to do with that record. No. Can you tell me a couple? from each record maybe that would help loosen my memory as i'm also one of those old buggers i'll have to look them up while i'm looking See, you them don't up, know either which one do you like better you don't know because I was a, of before the, i was in the I, band i, I to, was a... i have to say i like the new one a lot because it has the longest track they ever wrote and newest track I, I ever. yeah the one that they did with tom again on mrep um oh. And I like uh, the I like Stoner Witch a lot, but I also, as you probably do, I listen to an album as a whole. Um, oh, Stoner Witch, yeah. of course, has Revolve, Goose Freight Train, Ro Road Bull, 
And uh, the other one, to also name a few of them, uh, has Hooch, Lizzie, Going Blind, Honey Bucket, Hackney. Uh, I really like that Going Blind cover a lot. I got to play that live. That was a fun one. Okay. I, I will tell you of all those, before I was in the band, I really liked Stag. I thought Stag was amazing. It, that not it strange how when one talks about a band like the Melvins, you come up with different albums, and we always have to agree that they haven't made a single really bad record in all the years. No, I don't think so at all. When Prick came out, I listened to it all the time. Yeah, that was also something that I spoke with uh, spoke with Tom about. So let's yeah, just say like we that. have to agree every Melvin's album is the best Melvin's album. Absolutely. All number one. You choose between uh, Tomahawk and Phantomas. Mm, I'd have to go with Phantomas. Mm -hmm. San Francisco hippie sound of the 60s versus Seattle grunge. Oh, San Francisco. <laughs> San Francisco. Uh, oh, my God. I remember when that grunge shit started. That's when we were in the cows and we were all just like, what the fuck? It was the most regressive, backwards thinking. I just couldn't even believe it. It's like, this is so retro and uninspiring to my ears. Mm -hmm. I didn't like any of it. I thought it, I mean, no, I mean, I'm friends with a lot of those people. No offense to anyone, but it did absolutely nothing for me. It wasn't, I didn't find it inspiring or uh, anything. I just didn't like it at all. And so there's, I still plenty of that San Francisco hippie music that I would listen to. I don't think I even own a quote unquote grunge record. I don't even know what it is, but I don't have any unless Melvin's are grunge, which I don't think they are. I know that one, that one stupid metal, not one stupid metal label, but one stupid magazine in Germany in the mid '90s tried to label them as grunge, and I know that. Oh, I'm sure lots of. And people I'm very have, sure that like when, it. I'm very sure that. I'm not when, exaggerating. Uh, I don't have any of those records. I don't like any of that shit. Very, very interesting. Uh, do you also think that? I, here is something that I really want to go on. Do you think that you don't that you don't give a shit about it because you first of all dislike the music, or second of all, also because the hype was just simply too big? Nah, I was pleased about the hype. To be honest, I thought, mm -hmm. oh, this is great. At least it's people from my community. But I hated that music. It was so preposterously derived. I couldn't even believe it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't one. It wasn't a very original at all. Mm -hmm. and I just I, didn't I, like I, it. You know, I, I'm just nodding, but you know, m being a child of that era, maybe I would say differently. But I can, I could see what where you're going with it. Definitely, I could. Definitely oh, that's okay. That. I don't mean to offend. It just I couldn't believe it. But again, I didn't mind. I didn't mind all the hype. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, good. And I thought things were going to be different, but they weren't. I thought, oh, good, Nirvana. I knew they were. I knew they were interesting, intelligent people. Yeah, that'd be good. And then they did the same old shit all bands do in arenas. It wasn't different at all. Yeah, and I resent. When we that. talk about pay, fa famous projects or famous people, Elvis or Johnny <laughs> Cash? Oh, they're so different. I know. I'd have to go with Elvis, but I love Johnny Cash. I feel like a, a fool. Like, I would never insult Johnny Cash. Well, we're not insulting anybody. But um, I guess, yeah, it's that, you know that saying, push comes to shove? It means if I absolutely have to answer, I guess I'd say Elvis. Okay. Did you ask Crover that question? Uh, no, I think I asked him some other stuff. but, but I'd like to know what he thought of that. I bet he'd say Elvis, too. No, I, I know, but for sure I didn't ask him about Elvis or or Johnny. I, I'm I'm hundred. One time, me sure and Dale, me and Dale were in an elevator in Australia. See, I would have never known. And he looked, and there was an older guy in the elevator, and he goes, "He knew the guy's name. I can't remember." He goes, oh, "You're Elvis's drummer." He was so. I was excited too. He was wearing a Hawaiian shirt that said Elvis on it. He was so nice and so strange. <laughs> 
So two more to go. Uh, what do you prefer, touring or writing and recording? I didn't hear what you said. Oh, touring or writing or recording? Uh, writing and recording. I miss touring a lot. Okay. I miss it and a lot. Touring's good. Oh, well, go ahead. No, you go first. Go ahead. No, I've got nothing. Okay. Um, in case of recent events, I have to ask that. Uh, television versus Blondie. Television? Oh, the the bands. I thought you meant. I thought you meant the television. I like, no, I didn't. Oh, I'll pick the television. television Again, such Blondie. different, such different things. But yeah, I would go with Blondie, and I'm a big Tom Verlaine fan. But I would still go with Blondie. Uh oh. So okay, sorry. All good. All good. I, I have my eight months old here who wants to be taken out anyway. So, oh, okay. <laughs> Kevin, thanks for the interview. Thanks for all the records you've done by now. And thanks for those two totally different, but really, really mighty interesting records that are going to come out February 17th. And everybody should listen to them. Thanks for being thank on our show, Kevin. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it all your kind words <laughs> every single one of them is true you know you said the records were interesting you said the records were interesting that doesn't mean they're good no i think they are really good and i think that everybody should listen to both of them maybe uh, you're a crackhead or a pot whore or you just want to uneat stuff that's funny that that title's come up a few times it seems to have more impact on you and your Okay, have fun. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.